machine learning uh, we start with this uh, the basics an uh, introduction about the basics about the classical machine learning uh, and we also define the, uh, the, uh, the convention or the naming convention about the classical machine learning and quantum machine learning and uh, we actually mentioned that as far as we have a quantum computers that uh, these quantum computers are able to analyze the classical data then this is called quantum machine learning while if you have any uh, very advanced, up-to-date uh, machine learning algorithms that analyze a uh, classical data on a classical computer that is called a classical machine learning. And uh, regarding the classical machine learning, we'll discuss a bit about the uh, line uh, linear regression models, right? And uh, we uh, dive into some nonlinear regression models, like, for example, the polynomial model. And we had a problem actually with the polynomial model that if you increase, if you increase the degrees of the polynomial or you increase the, the freedom actually of the model to express your data, then you hit an overfitting problem. And to solve this problem, we uh, propose a kind of solutions about what's called the regularized model, where we penalize the, uh, the model by adding a term that if you increase the number of the degrees of the polynomial, then the lo your uh, loss function or your error function does increase, the value increases. So this is how you regularize it, like you clip. And uh, in last lecture, actually, uh, yesterday, we discussed about the in-sample learning, right? So we give an example uh, about the decision tree and how can we actually combine uh, many trees together, many decision trees together, to make an ensemble learning, such as the random forest and the boosted decision trees. And those are, uh, if you remember the chart that we show in the last lecture, in the first lecture, about the difference between the AI, machine learning, ensemble learning, deep learning, neural network. So you, you remember that. So all of this, uh, what we have discussed, is about uh, uh, machine learning. So now, we just start to get deep. And by deep, I mean that. So uh, this is a website, it's called Neural Network Background, Playground. And I advise you to go in there. And the, the idea here is that we have uh, like a couple of uh, two uh, points, like two data sets. So uh, let me ask again. So if we have, if we want to distinguish between orange and blue points, what kind of problem that we are dealing with? Good. So uh, this is a classification problem, and we want to classify the uh, blue data, blue points from the orange points. Okay. So look. Now we start the yearbooks, the iteration, and then we have this uh, structure of the neural network. And here, 
you will see the classification boundaries, the slots to classify, right? So as far as we increase, the, as far as we iterate more and more, the, the model actually is able to classify the uh, different data points, like the blue points or orange points. But what exactly is this? So let's give a, have a, a look. We have this data, and this data is two-dimensional data. It has x1 and x2. x1 and x2. And then we have the inputs. So we have how many features can we use? Actually, we can use any number of features that we have. So the first feature we have is nothing but the x1. And then we have x2. But then we have x1 squared. Like take the value, x1 is uh, value, and square it. We have x2 squared. And then we have x1 times x2. We could also have another feature, which is the sign of x1 and the sign of x2. So those are my inputs. Those are some features that I give to the neural network to just to teach the neural network about the characteristic features of different uh, data points from different classes. So as you can see here, uh, this is the type of the problem that we are dealing with. So here, this is a classification problem, right? So we could choose also a, a regression. But if we have a regression problem, then how this data looks like? Continuous. Huh? Continuous. Yes, continuous color, right? Also, we have here, this is the regularization rate. Like, this is the lambda parameter that we use when we regularize the data, like L1 regularization or L2 regularization, right? And also, uh, we have uh, here, uh, this is the regularization to, to choose either L1 regularization or L2 regularization. Here, this is the activation function, and we are going to talk about this uh, in detail in the next slides. Uh, this is the learning rate. So we all knows about the, know about the learning rate, right? We'll discuss about this. Right, and uh, this is the number of epochs, and epochs is the iteration at every time we measure the cost function or the error function, and then we update the weights again and again, such that we minimize the error function by using uh, some of the optimization algorithm. Here, this is the, the ratio of uh, between the training and the, the testing data set, uh, so I use it like half and half. So I have exactly the same amount of the training data and testing data. Uh, well, so as you can see, we have a fully connection of the weights between, uh, between the different hidden layers. So all the weights of the first input layers are fully connected to the second hidden layers, to the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth, and then we have an output. And in this output, we just measure the probability. And as you can see, it ranges between zero and one. So as far as the first class has a probability uh, near to one, that means the points in the first class is most likely classified as uh, belongs to the blue points. Uh, also at the second uh, mirror here, if the probability is uh, large near to one, that means the points that we give here are most likely classified to be belongs to the second class, which is the orange one. So uh, this is looks a bit complicated, so let's see how that things work. Well, so this is the structure. So we have a kind of like a bunch of row features. Uh, this is X, this is, uh, this is these things here. And then uh, we add a linear model, right? So we all know, know about the linear model, right? So discuss this. Please, do not escape that. Any question? Any question? Okay. Huh? Can we increase the definition of the image? Oh, no. I just said it. I mean, if you want to ask something about it, but you, you can just reply to the definition. OK, so anyway, the linear model actually can classify or can describe a linear data. A data that's just linear. And in a linear model, is just you, you can describe the data with the line, straight line. Okay, so as far as we have, uh, like here, we have a bit complicated structure of the input data, then uh, of course, linear model will not uh, save the day. 
So we need to add a source of nonlinearity. And this is what comes here. So we have another uh, nonlinear, uh, we call this as an activation layer, that adds a source of nonlinearity to the linear model. And then, after combining these two layers together, then we have a completely new good features that we don't see by, by our eyes. We can take these good features and then we add another linear model and then we have the predictions. So how this is mathematically looks like. So the y hat, which is the prediction or the probability of the model that falsifies the data, it either it most likely belongs to the first class or the second class, then it can be as the W transpose, this here, the weights, uh, times the X tilde. And X tilde is the new generated features from the original features, right? So it's an original feature, but we add a source of nonlinearity to this feature. And X tilde here, if you just substitute to the X tilde, this one, so it's nothing but the activation function, right? So this is kind of a uh, uh, nonlinear function with, which acts on the W type X. So how this is, uh, looks in just open the books, uh, the, this, uh, the, 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 the books, uh, it's the, the layers itself. So here we have the data that we have, uh, the input features like X1, X2, X3, and then the XD, which is the dimension of the, uh, this uh, victory here. And then as a poly connection, then we have uh, all the, this, the first neuron actually connected to all the neurons in the second layer. And also here, so everything is fully connected to the second hidden layer. And those are the uh, first, or these are the weights, uh, it's a matrix of the first hidden layer. And then here, we have the feature, uh, X tilde. We add more, uh, like a source of nonlinear uh, uh, function, to have a new uh, data set, uh, a new data, uh, a new a new data, and the dimension of this data is d prime. So if this is d, now we have a d prime. That means we can control the length of each hidden layer. It should not be fixed, right? Like here, here. So for example, this is a, of dimension d. This should not be the same dimension. We can change the number of the neurons in each layer. And this is how it goes the sum here, right? So here we sum over j, which is the length of this layer, and then this is the i, so the i is the length of this uh, layer, and then the j of the length of this layer. So here, this is how we compute the y hat. Well, so let's uh, uh, define some uh, naming convention that we might use uh, during the uh, rest of this lecture. So uh, this is the input feature, and the layer that can be or take the, these input features are called the input layer. And then we have a dense layer. And this dense layer is a linear layer. So there is nothing but just like a linear model. And we know that the, the, the equation for a linear model happened. Does anybody remind me for the linear model? Y hat, which is what? W L B. Huh? W X plus B. Sorry? W X plus B. Exactly. So it's B zero X plus B, right? So, and that is the uh, intersection, the slow line intersection of the model, right? So this is exactly this one here. So if you look here, here, W X, but just for simplicity, we remove this one. We call this as a bias, right? So this is how it goes here. And then to add source of nonlinearity, then we can add the function here. So to add the uh, or to act with the uh, activation layer, then we could add some source of nonlinearity. So now y hat is nothing but j, right? I gave you an example, I just I gave example of j, if you remember in the introduction lecture about the classical machine learning. So does anybody remember what was the nonlinear activation function? 
Yes? Exactly. Yeah, you are good today. <laughs> so we have a bunch of uh, different activation layers that add, can add a source of nonlinearity to the model. OK, well, so the, to define uh, the hidden layer, which is the one layer, then it could decompose two sub-layers. The first layer we call it a dense layer, and then another activation layer which include the source of the nonlinearity which is required by the deep neural network model to explain and express or approximate more complicated nonlinear data, right? So uh, for, uh, for a single layer, uh, like the, the, the neural network that contains only one input layer, one hidden layer, and one output layer, this is shallow uh, neural network, and we call this as an artificial neural network. Okay. But if you want to describe more uh, complicated data, like a data structure with very high complicated, like for example images, or uh, correlated data, like a Facebook, that, that just a, a recommendation system, like for example on Facebook, uh, we have lots of, uh, if you open this, uh, the Facebook, then you find lots of advertise, uh, adver uh, advertisements that come to you, right? And you found most of them are you are happy about this, right? About this ads. So how did Facebook know that? It, because of that thing. So they do some recommendation systems and they analyze your data and then you find the most probable uh, ads that you mostly gonna like and they send it to you. And the data there, it's a billions of data, right? So it's the data that includes all the users of the Facebook, for example, and then they, they try to collect the information about what's your age, what's your uh, location, uh, your favorites, etc. The last thing you did reception. Sorry? The last thing you, you research. Ah, this is also, yeah. This is also, yeah. This is also can be used as, as, as a good feature. And then you combine all of this and they try to cook a machine learning model to analyze and uh, find the highest probabilistic ads that you may be like. So to do so, of course, one hidden layer is not enough to, uh, uh, to analyze the structure of the data, very, very large data. So we had to add more and more layers. And the, uh, the, the neural network actually with more hidden layers is called multi-layer neural network or multi-layer perceptions. Well, so uh, now we uh, just fix it, the conventions of a uh, naming convention of the neural network and deep learning, and now let's see how can we train the neural network model. So to train the model, actually, uh, there are two processes here that we have to go uh, through. The first one, which is called the forward propagation, and then we have the new concept, which is called back propagation. So. As we, all the models actually that we discussed, like all the machine learning models, even the Boston decision tree and random forest, we don't have this, right? Right? We don't have this, the back propagation. So as far as you have a back propagation, this is a new new. So how this works? So first we have all the inputs, all the data, and then uh, we add the weights, like a fully connected for the uh, first hidden layer. And then we have the bias. We, uh, we, we pass this to some uh, nonlinear activation function. And then we measure the y hats. From the y hats, this is supervised learning, right? So we know what is the true value. So from the y hat, we can compute the loss function. But then we need to update the loss, the weights, or the free parameter again, such that we hit the global minimum, minimum of the loss function. So how we did that before? Anyone can answer? Yes? Uh, bring in the sun. Exactly. And then we updated the yes. W and D. Yes, exactly. Until we yes. And then yes, so if you remember, in the, uh, in the linear model, uh, when we have this, uh, uh, this animation that I show, that when we have this uh, kind of uh, linear data, uh, like, if you remember this kind of uh, data that's kind of uh, like this, and then we found the line here 
that can fit the data, right? And the, 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 the equation of the line is basically this one. So we have uh, P0x uh, plus uh, P1, for example. And uh, we try to find always the best value of P0 and P1 that minimize the error, right? And make that make that makes the line based to fit the, the data points. Remember that, right? And from this we compute the error here all the time. Exactly the same here, but in a different technique. I'm I'm going to discuss this. Well, so uh, every time we do uh, first a forward forward propagation. So we forward all the, uh, the data, the inputs and the weights and compute everything to compute the y hat. And then we do back propagation by updating the three parameters or the weights of each layer. And this closed loop is called ebook. So the ebook is one iteration, one closed iteration. Well, so <coughs> uh, this is how we compute actually the output or the activation or the output of the uh, one neuron uh, after the activation function. So, uh, of course, we need to add a source of nonlinearity, otherwise we are doing nothing, right? So we could actually, we can construct a neural network that can solve a linear problem, right? We can do that. We just remove the activation function, the source of nonlinearity, just remove it. And then you, you end up with a linear model at the end. So to explain uh, and uh, describe a more complicated structure like nonlinear separable data, we need to add the activation function here. And this is the equation that I wrote here, how this is the output after the, uh, for each neuron uh, after you add the activation function. And now the question is, what kind of activation function do we have to use? Well, so the computer scientists are very nice fancy guys and they offer lots of activation functions so you can you have the freedom to choose whatever you want so some examples this one is called relu or uh, rectified linear function and uh, it gives you uh, zero and a maximum of x so if x is negative it returns zero and, it, and it, then if x larger than uh, it's positive it returns back the same value of x we have also here what's called a leaky, leaky relu, and uh, this is nothing but you just multiply uh, the x value by some uh, alpha parameter like 0.1, 0.2, whatever, and this is a hyperparameter. So does anybody please remind me what is hyperparameter? Ah, oh, not you. Sorry. Any other guy? Hyperparameter. What is hyperparameter? Exactly. So this is a parameter that the machine learning model cannot fix its value by itself. The user has to fix it, right? So this, the, uh, the alpha here is a hyperparameter that the user has to fix. Uh, here, this is tench, uh, activation function. This is a step function. This is a linear function. This is a relu. Uh, this is uh, what's called ilu. Uh, and uh, this is a, like uh, instead of having a zero, then we could have a regular, regularized value, uh, like instead of uh, like instead of having this, uh, this is the Bruno function, which is zero and x everywhere. No, we have like a regularized one. So we have this, and this is alpha, and you can find define this alpha as 0.1, 0.2, .2, whatever you want. And now the question is. Okay, fine. So we have a plurality uh, uh, of uh, activation function. Um, which one uh, we have to use, right? So the actually the model, uh, like the machine learning model, is very very. Oh, sorry. Okay. So you see here the machine learning model is uh, the neural net, the deep neural network model is very very rich, and at each of those hidden layers we have to choose activation function, right? So, how can we define those? That's a question. So, how can we define the activation here at each layer? Which one what shall we use? Here. So, do you have any guess for that? Type of data? No. No. 
Okay, by experience. So uh, you, you do more, right? And then you can find the best one that fits. But not only this, but also uh, we have some problems, like all in the hidden layers, in the hidden layers, in the layer in between, we always use the rim, right? So by experience, we use the Reno. And I'm going to show you uh, why we use the Reno. Like the Reno is the common uh, activation function that been used in the hidden layers in a moment. Uh, but you, you also, of course, are free to choose whatever you want. But at every time uh, you do more uh, uh, or you solve more one problem, then you got the experience and you got information about what kind of uh, a, a activation function that you can use to solve a very specific problem. So we don't know the reason for using a certain uh, function for a certain problem, because I think that, that it was like we first uh, test, then think for the reason after that. That's true, but I'm going to show you uh, one specific reason why we use the uh, radio and the hidden layers. But this is, uh, this is in famous problems. And okay. yeah, like a common choice, yes. But uh, you are free to, to, to change anyone. But and if the problem is new, there is no clue. Yes, so this is what I said here. If you don't know, like if you, this is your uh, first time doing machine learning, then you should have do some uh, random grid search. And random grid search is that we have all the hidden layers, right? So this is the first hidden layer, second, third, right? And each one of those should have uh, activation function. So I create, like for example, I try this one, all these functions. This one I tried the second one, and third one, and so on. And this is what's called a uh, grid search uh, optimization. But this is not efficient. Of course, they may you may uh, spend uh, your life just for solving oh, one problem. Uh, so yeah. So the the best solution is that you should have get some help from uh, some ex uh, experience. But the meaning of this is that we, we don't understand the mechanism that the neural network working on basic level. Right? We no, we know. Uh, we know, uh, we write the, the basic algorithm, but I mean, like if we know it exactly, we should have like, know the common uh, rules. For yeah, this is, a, I'm going to show you in a moment. Just but but it comes with experience, not uh, general rules. Uh, that's a true, that's a true, but there is some basic, choices that you could use. You know what I mean, right? Okay, so uh, uh, as we discussed before, uh, so now we know how the, uh, the structure of the activation layer uh, looks like. So now let's see how can we do the updates, like the back propagation, right? So this is all about the forward propagation, right? So we know how to compute the linear model and then how to add the activation layer on, on top of the, uh, the output of the linear model. And then let's see how the back propagation now is being computed. So after we compute the loss, uh, then we need to update the weights, right? Such that we hit a global minimum of the loss function that we use, okay? So how can we do that? How can we compute the gradient? In principle, this is a very simple uh, structure of a neural network. So it's only like four layer, four neurons, two layers, and that's it. So how can we compute that? Answer? Chin rule, right? So you know about the chin rule. Good. So uh, having here, uh, this is uh, this is the input uh, layer, and then we have four inputs: x1, x2, x3. Three, it's four, and then we have all the weights for the first layer, and the, uh, all the weights for the first layer I label them with a superscript one, okay, and then at the end this W is a matrix, right? So it carry two indices. So we have one, 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 two, one, three, one, four, and so on and so forth, right? Two, one, two, 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 three, and so on. So those two uh, indices just uh, indicate the number of neurons and which neurons they are connected, while the superscript over here just indicate that we are in the first hidden layer, this is in the second hidden layer, this is in the third hidden layer. So it's, it's kind of a matrix. Well, so now, for example, we use this uh, uh, mean square error function, and uh, I want actually to compute the, uh, the updated value for W 
three one one, which is this one. So how can we do that? Please note that this here there is an activation function of the output, right? So we can use the chain rule. So the chain rule is that the partial derivative of the loss function with respect to W311, which is basically this gradient here, is nothing but the partial derivative uh, of the L uh, for the, 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 the activation function here, right? Times the uh, partial derivative of the activation function with respect to this W311. Uh, and now, this is simple, this is straightforward. So we want now to update this one here. So it's a bit far, right? So how can we do that? So let's take this one, this root here. So we can differentiate this one here, right? But also we have here another function. So we add this term. So partial f21 with partial derivative of uh, the w211, right? But this is one root. Still another root that we could have also the differentiation here. So we'll add some. Right? Is that clear for everybody? Okay. And now, this is a very simple one, right? So how, how do you think about that? Like, for example, we want to update the weights this one. Right? So you can think how many the analytical expression looks like, right? So it's, it's very, very tedious, very, very large. So there is no way to do it by hand, right? Like here, no way to update the weights by hand. So the only way to do that, as we are lucky, there is a, a concept or a new concept in the programming language, actually. It's called automatic differentiation, or how to do it. So uh, how this auto diff actually looks like, it's uh, very simple. Then you know uh, how many of you are familiar with the Python programming and modules in Python? Okay, that's fine. So you know there is a module in Python called uh, symbolic Python or SignPy, right? And this is can so you do some uh, symbolic calculation, exactly like mathematical, right? But also we have the NumPy, and this NumPy is the numerical uh, the numerical module or the numerical library that can solve lots of uh, high dimension, very complicated uh, tensors in numbers for you. So combining these two together, like we uh, solve the first of compute the differentiation uh, symbolically, and then on fly, we substitute the numerical value that saved the day. And this is what's called the automatic differentiation. So uh, to do so, then there is, as I told you in the first lecture, there are two ways that you can do the uh, machine learning uh, you can do some machine learning uh, algorithm uh, on those two ways, uh, which are the TensorFlow, and this one is powered by Google, and the Bytoosh, then this one is powered or, uh, uh, by, uh, by Facebook, right? And both of them, you can use the automatic differentiation. So simply to see how this uh, out of diff actually is being implemented, like in programming, how this implemented in Bytoosh or TensorFlow, just uh, write uh, down or uh, type in a Google uh, TensorFlow out to them or PyTorch out to them and automatically show you how this kind of things work. But this calculations, no way to do it analytically, no way to find some program to do it for you. We need an out to them. Well, so if that motivates you, then uh, let's uh, jump to another problem. So, of course, all of you knows about the universal approximation theory. Right? So this is the one that we've mentioned in the first lecture. And the universal approximation theorem, it says that given any continuous fun function, no matter how complicated the shape of the function is, we can define uh, or there is always exists a, a neural network with only one hidden layer that can approximate this function, no matter the complication of this function is. And the given the proof is that so uh, as you can see, this is the function that we try to approximate. This is the, uh, the, 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 the black line here. And uh, if you have only like a, a hidden layer with one, two, three, four neurons, then you have a weight. So you have the freedom to describe it, to approximate this one, right? So I have one, two, three, four. 
So maybe you approximate this, but still with some uncertainty, like uh, some uh, error in between, because you didn't have the freedom or freedom to approximate this one. So what to do, actually, increase the number of the neurons in this. So increasing the number of the neurons, that means we add more weights, right? So those weights are more degrees of freedom to describe your problem. And adding more neurons over here, then you add more weights, we divide the subspace under this uh, function, into more and more, such that your calculation and your approximation is very, very precise, okay? So that's clear. And now the question is, okay, fine, that's for only one hidden layer, I can describe a continuous function. But what about this discontinuous function, or data with a very, very complicated structure, right? So we need more and very deep neural network. And even we need a convolution of neural network, which I'm going to discuss about next time. So uh, it just it's, it's very simple. How can you cook a, a deep neural network with a many hidden layer? If you know how to build your first hidden layer, as this one here, as this one here, then you just repeat again and again. It's very simple, like repeat sequentially. That's it. But the subtle question now is that: Are we free to use any number of hidden layers or not? Overfit huh? vanishing gradients. This No, we are not. Okay. Why? Because there is a problem. Besides the overfitting problem, there is another problem which is called the vanishing gradient. So, what actually is the vanishing gradient? So, just think of this very deep, or quite deep, neural network as been shown here. So, this is. Input layer, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine hidden layers and one output layer, right? And this is all fully connected to each other. So to update the weights here, for the, for the first weights here, right? We need to compute the gradients. But at some point, you find that gradient vanish. It hit zero. So what happened if the gradient is zero? Huh? Yes, so W is always W O. And we cannot do any upgrade. So this is exactly as if you have, this is the how the loss function looks like. So this is the, uh, your, for example, MSE, right? And then you start from here and take some steps down here, right? Right? To hit the global minimum. But with this vanishing gradient, there is no way to update your weights. So that means you're stuck here. You will never reach a global minimum if you hit the vanishing gradient problem. So first, let's see what the uh, what causes the vanishing gradient problem. Well, so uh, this is type of activation functions, right? And uh, there are different types like the state uh, logits, uh, which is the uh, sigmoid. Uh, and then we have tens, and then we have a real. And this is the differentiation. So if you, if you differentiate this function, here how it looks like. And uh, if you look here, for example, you find this tens function. It always has a zero value outside the uh, the mean zero here for the value, like for the x, right? And we call this as a saturation. So, for example, look at the uh, sigmoid function that we always discuss about. So, this pink line is the sigmoid, right? So, you remember how it looks like. This one, right? It's 1 over 1 plus e to minus x, right? So, this is how it looks like. And if you differentiate this function, you get this shape. So the, the, the gradient of the sigmoid function always have a zero value away from the x equals zero. So, and this is how, what makes the uh, vanishing gradient problem to take place. And now if you look here, you find the ReLU, right? So look how the ReLU looks like, right? So the ReLU here, has a surviving probability very large to hit the saturation. 
you see? So this is answering your question, which is why we use a rim. Because it's mostly hard to have this vanishing rate problem. So this is kind of a mathematical reason why conventionally or commonly we use the ReLU activation function inside the hidden layers just to avoid the problem with the vanishing rate. Okay? Well, so uh, how now we need some solutions for that. First, we could use the ReLU or Laker ReLU. Both of them can save the day. But not guaranteed, like not 100% guaranteed, but it still can save, save the game. And also using what's called the batch normalization layer. So if the X, like after each hidden layer, if I found that the X moves in this direction and this direction, I return it back, I normalize it back to stay here, such that I don't have this uh, vanishing gradient or the saturation of the differentiation of loss function, uh, of the uh, activation function. And also, one can adjust the learning rates or reduce the number of the hidden layers. This is also another possible solution, right? Because as far as you increase the number, you find that here we have a vanishing gradient. The gradient here is almost zero. So if you like reduce the number and you keep only these hidden layers, then most probably you will not get into the vanishing gradient right Or collect the weights, like you collect this here and there. So you always click to just to stay in between. But those are not efficient solutions. And at the end, most of the solutions in uh, machine learning, in classical machine learning, or even in quantum machine learning, is that depends on the, some grid search optimization. So you do one step, you do one uh, action, and then you measure the output performance of your model. And then according to that action, either you accept or reject. You know. Well, so that was about the uh, vanishing gradient problems and the, the depth, actually, of the uh, machine learning model and the neural network model. But still, also another problem, which is the convergence. So, in in a very simple data like this, you could have a loss function, continuous loss function, which has a very nice global mean. But in the real world or in real in real real life, this is not the case. Actually, we have a very rough service of the uh, of the loss function, which exhibits lots of local minimum, and that's dangerous because at some point we may hit this one, but we don't need that, right? So actually, what is the solution to uh, like be sure or increase your probability to stay in a global minimum? And it stayed minimum instead of uh, stuck in one of the local minimum. Of course, you know at the beginning when you initialize the weights for the first iteration, like here. Let me back again. Sorry. Here, so how we first for the first iteration, how we initialize or how we fix the weights, the value of these weights. Yes. Exactly. So. We assign a random numbers to those weights at the first iteration, right? But this is dangerous because if you assign this random, maybe you start here, maybe you start here, maybe you start there. So we don't know the random initialization of your weights when actually your uh, 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 loss function or your starting point is. So as you can see, for example, if you stay here or start here, then most probably you can hit this global minimum. But if you're here, then maybe you're stuck in some of the local minimum. So that's problematic. So how to solve this? So instead of uh, training or do the iteration or update the weights for each and every data point in your sample, then we could have what's called the uh, uh, batch uh, or stochastic uh, descent. So how can we do that? This is called stochastic gradient descent. And instead of taking each point in the data, no, we randomly take a sub subsample of the data, and then we update the, 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 the weights at each sample of this data. So the, the weights are updated frequently. And uh, have you ever heard of this stochastic? What stochastic means? Intuition? 
Exactly. And this is, and this is how it looks here. So if we do uh, like a gradient descent, where we have each point, we update the weights for each and every point. Uh, That's what I found. Then you are smoothly hit the global minimum. But if we do some uh, gradient, uh, like a stochastic gradient descent, then we have this zigzag uh, kind of. But there are two advantages actually in the story. One advantage and one disadvantage. The advantage here is that if we have uh, this uh, fluctuation, then maybe it's enough to skip the global, the local minimum, and hit a, a global minimum, right? So, like here, maybe if you have this zigzag, then it maybe hit here immediately and skip the local minimum. But also, if this uh, kind of uh, stochastic behavior is very, very large, then there is also a, pr a probability to miss the global minimum itself. So, how to solve that? Then to solve that, we need to add a momentum. So, if you heard about this momentum uh, concept, it's nothing but it's exponential weighted moving average behavior. So, how can we do that? No, 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 no. So it basically you have a bunch of data, then you can smooth that, right? So it's a kind, of, it's kind of a smoothing here. It's kind of a smoothing your data to some line or something like that. Yes, please. This. Ah, it's nothing. You just randomly sample from data. And then instead of updating the weights for each voids, like x1, x2, x3, x4, and each input, then you just take a subsample of that, and then you update the weights accordingly. So as far as you take subsample of the whole space or the whole regulation, then you don't have a full vision or full information about the characteristic feature of the Sorry? Of course, yes. Here, all of this is a training. On the test, we don't touch anything. You just get the data to the model after you train, and then you ask for the predictions. That's it. OK? Good. So how we smooth that one? How we smooth the uh, stochastic behavior of this? We use the exponential weighted moving average. And to do the exponential weighted moving average, we compute this, how we compute that. So first we start with the VT, uh, some variable, which is basically this line here, this line here, and then this VT, it's weighted. So we should have some weight parameter, beta. And this beta is just multiplied by VT minus one. And then plus one minus beta F of T, F of T is this value. So VT minus one, you can compute it here, and this is it always depends on the previous step. And this is why we call it moving. And the question now is why we call this exponential moving average? Hmm? What, I, what I understand is that we're trying to make it, to don't make it very random, like the gradient yes, yes, the yes. steps. Yes, the that's true. Is to make it small. Yes, that's true. This is what we want to do. But exponential, because if you substitute back, 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 back to this one, we will find an exponential series. So this is why we call it exponential weighted moving average. Okay? And of course, the beta parameter is ranging between 0 and 1. Depends on the beta. Okay, so this plot here, and all of these plots, you find the codes for this on the GitHub. So you can access this one. I think I call this uh, like a stochastic gradient descent or uh, weighted moving average, something like that. So you can find these plots and the outputs here. So according to the value, depends on the value of the beta here, then you can find how the data has been smoothed. So consider now the data points, which is, has uh, uh, exhibit random uh, behavior, and the data is these black points. And then if we use a beta of uh, value 0.2, then you have this blue line. So this blue line is still uh, shows some stochastic uh, behavior. It's fluctuating much. And now just increase the value of the beta parameter to open five, then you start open nine, then you have a quite smooth one here, right? And if you increase to open uh, eight, nine, you have a completely flat. Too much. 
Exactly. The problem here is that if you increase the beta more, then this is my flat in, uh, or uh, at zero. So we don't need this one as well, right? And in machine learning algorithm, we usually use that momentum uh, parameter or their parameter at 0.9. So I can use the, the uh, stochastic gradient descent with the momentum in, in, in uh, machine learning. Uh, we update the weights. Now the W new equals W old minus eta, the learning rate, times the VT. And the VT is now the uh, smooth data uh, point. Okay? So now we have, if this is the stochastic gradient descent looks like, it's a show random uh, the stochastic behavior, then the, uh, the stochastic gradient descent with the momentum show a less, uh, a less uh, more uh, stochastic or random uh, behavior to hit the mean. Well, so what we have discussed, that the gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent, or stochastic gradient descent with the momentum, this is all the learning rate speaks. But this is not what we want. This is, this is not elegant. Because what means the, uh, the learning rate is fixed? The step size here is fixed all the time, right? This is not efficient. Because we want, at the beginning here, we take a large steps. And once we hit down, we take a very, very baby steps. Uh, so so not to hit the local minimum. To be sure that you are fast, in, very fast, hit the global minimum. Uh, and not trap also in a local minimum, right? So how we control the step size? As how we go, we make it the previous. No, no, just uh, like no. Okay, so we call this as an adaptive gradient uh, descent. In short, it's called adaptive. So how it looks like? So now we have the normal, uh, 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 the normal equation for weight updation. So we have the W new equals W old minus now instead of eta, then eta now is a free parameter, right? We control the learning rate. So we'll call this as an eta prime times the, uh, the nebula or the, uh, the gradient of the loss function. So now we use this uh, learning rate as the initial learning rate you fix by, by, uh, by yourself over the square root of alpha t plus epsilon. And alpha t now is the sum over all the previous <coughs> gradient descent, or all the previous uh, gradients, right? So that means that as far as I give in the steps, I'm pretty sure that the learning rate is going to decrease, right? Because this one is always increasing, because we sum all the previous gradients. So this one is always increasing. And we have the epsilon here because this is a regularization parameter. Because at some point, if this one vanish, this will be divergent. So we have to use this epsilon term here. But the problem is, if you have more and more steps, then you find that you start with a large one, and then small, 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 small. As far as you do more uh, steps and more iteration, you find that the steps are going to be very, very small. And at some point, maybe you lose it. It goes to zero, right? If that one is very, very large, then the alpha is very large, then this one might be very small, like a, almost zero or something like that. But anyway, this is what we have here. So we have like a very large steps, and then toward the minimal, as far as we go to the minimal, this is uh, it's being small. So how can we solve that one? So how will we solve this problem? Yes, please? Two questions. Uh, first one, why should the summation uh, vanish? It's, it's squared. So I, I actually have my past terms. I didn't say uh, it should have vanished, but we have the vanishing rate problem, right? Uh -huh. So if you have this problem, then this term diverges. So we have this epsilon. But always, all the time, this gradient, sum of the gradients is increasing. Yes, second question. Uh, we can use this with stochastic gradient uh, descent as well. Other question. Yes. Uh, epsilon is a hyperparameter. Epsilon. Yeah, it's a very small number. It's just to regularize. It's just to prevent this. So if you have a vanishing gradient problem here, then this one is just to regularize. I can't calculate it. Huh? I 
can't have it. So I can We take it very, very small value, like at minus 7 to minus 9. For a specific value, or just try and error? Huh? For a specific value, I should just try. So I know this is, you don't have to do try an error here, because if you have a vanishing gradient problem, then you have a more bigger problem than this epsilon. So, <laughs> so it's, you can put it like into minus 7 to minus 9, it's okay. It, 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 it does not affect your calculations. Because if you need this epsilon, then you have a previous problem which is bigger than this epsilon. Okay, well, so this is how it's called the root many square propagation, and in short, it's called Armist problem. And this is a very advanced uh, optimization technique, more than the uh, gradient itself. So what we do here, we do uh, this momentum on the, the stochastic uh, steps, but here we remove the sum. Okay, so we just remove the sum. So if you look here, we have the sum. So that means this sum is always increasing. But here, as far as we remove the sum, then the error uh, primal, the new learning rate, now depends only on the previous step, not on the all the steps that we have, right? So it's not depends on all of this. It's just to compute the, uh, the sum uh, or the uh, gradient or the, sorry, the differentiation of the previous step. And this is what, how we guarantee that we have a smooth, very, very smooth transition to the global minima with, without having these uh, vanishing steps, if we have uh, like in the undergrad or the adoptive uh, learning, or even this is stochastic thing. So we have a very smooth transition towards the global minima. And faster. That's good. I will show you. I'll prove that. Just keep this in mind. And last one is called adaptive moment, moment estimation. In short, it's called ad optimization. And this is the standard. So the whole community uses this ad optimization. And ad optimization, it combines all the advantages that we have discussed. From the gradient descent, to so the stochastic gradient descent, to the gradient descent with momentum, uh, iron is broke in one optimizer, and this is how ad optimizer looks like. And if you look here, we have an analysis of the MNS data set. You don't know what this MNS data is. Does anybody know about that? This dimension. I'll show you. Huh? What's the name? MNS. MNS digit data set for fashion I will show you. I will grab an example of that. And written digits? That's true. So I have uh, this uh, here, this uh, in this paper. Uh, so we have the undergrad, the RMS probe, uh, SGD with the momentum, stochastic gradient descent with the momentum, Ada, Delta, and Adam. And as far as you can see, Adam Optimizer gave the best solution and the best optimization algorithm, even for a very complicated uh, 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 problem here. Huh? Yes, this is a great thing. Well, so uh, this is here, this is a comparison. Uh, very, uh, this, we have two many. One global minimum and one another global minimum. And then we have the gradient descent. Gradient de descent with the momentum, this is the pink line. We have adaptive grade, which is the red, uh, uh, white uh, line. And we have the RMS probe. And we have the atom. And now looks how it looks like. You see? Only atom optimizer that succeed to hit the global minimum. All the rest. And here, how you see, this is the global minima, this is the local minima. Okay? So, as you can see, only the error optimizer succeed to hit the global minimum. I just do that again. All the others just attract on the local minimum. And this is just a proof for you why do we need this error optimizer, which is an, a standard optimization algorithm in the machine learning on any deep learning. And of course, this program, you can use this one. Another example is a, uh, a function uh, or a loss function with a saddle, saddle point in here. So I see at an optimizer, at a grad, uh, and uh, this, uh, the arms probe went immediately to the global minimum where the, uh, uh, the non-adoptive gradient methods just have a zigzag. So they go first to the saddle point and then they went to the global minimum. As for you, you see that. You see how slow is that? Uh -huh. This is the adaptive grade. 
a very very slow it's not even going to anywhere so it's just stop and before it's we fail, it's a very slow. exactly another uh, example for a function those function with some let loop you have here so if you look other grad is very is very very slow so may I ask you why did one just miss the global minimum complicated this one because that's the momentum right since so still so at some point it miss the money and then come back in right so to be safe for all of this kind of behavior people actually use this one the atom because it's safe right I show you all the uh, all methods or kind of different kinds of loss function and the atom optimizer is the fast one is the accurate one is the one that we guarantee that he always, all the time, is going to hit the group. Last one, this example for a very simple uh, complex uh, shape function. Everything is okay, still the other is okay. So I hope now you got an intuition about what is the best optimization algorithm that you might use when dealing with such a problem, uh, like a very complicated problem. Okay? So it, uh, do it doesn't have problems? <coughs> I don't know. Adam optimizer. Adam optimizer. Don't have problems. Like uh, some some problems that. It Actually, at the moment, it doesn't have any problem. So, so this is the standard. Uh, so this is the standard one, a common one that everyone is using. Well, so I would like to show you. Uh, this is uh, a theory. It's called no free lunch theory. And this is uh, been published. I don't know what kind of journal <laughs> that's published, but it's, uh, you can find this on archive. And uh, the theory is it says that all the optimization methods and machine learning models are similar under some certain constraints. And what that means that mean if you try all the optimization algorithm and uh, just average all of them, then everything is the same. So again, there is no a specific machine learning model that fits everything or solve everything, all the problem, although we have to see what is actually the, the, the machine learning problem that fits this, uh, the machine learning model that fits this problem, even if the machine learning is very sharp. Like for example, we can, if we have a linear model, a linear problem like this one, we don't have to do a very complicated, high, uh, deep machine learning model, because we are going to hit lots of other problems, like vanishing gradient, the overfitting, all of this kind of problem. Although we can define a very simple um, machine learning in the Eve shadow machine learning algorithm to set the day, right? So this is the, like, in, in, in conclusion, how this no free lunch theory is just the, Actually, it's also here. We don't have a free lunch, right? <laughs> <laughs> so this is a confirmation. This is another confirmation of the theory. Okay, so, okay, so, uh, shall I finish at uh, 5.30 or I, I have time? I don't know, you can have a free cake. Yeah, you can finish whatever you like, but I'm not sure these people will... Uh, okay, so as far as you enjoy, so I can continue, otherwise if you got frustrated, then just raise your hands and then you can finish, okay? I mean, let me ask you some of the things I have to do. I mean, can, how many of them, because I remember a lot of this stuff from a very long time ago, how many of these methods are actually from a fundamental point of view in you? How many what, sir? How many of the global minimum methods are really new that, say, in the last 20 years, on a theoretical Yeah, I think those are uh, those the ones that are Oh, but many of, the, many of those you discussed are actually no, the other one was very Yeah, good. that is new. Yes. That is new. And uh, RS broke the whole suite of paper. Well, anyway, huh? like what year? When did it come out? I think it's uh, 20, the end of the year. I don't remember actually, but you can find the other one. Many of the methods, the ones with the epsilon, for example. Yes, I remember from that's the very old. That back, uh, yes. thing is that's that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Algorithm group. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's true. It's from 60s. That's true. That's true. So the, this is the paper for the Adam optimizer. Yeah. And I think we can. So that's you know, okay. so that's the result because a lot of the stuff I remember from the yes. old one. That's true. And in most recent one, like in the, the, the last year, they have Adam 
adapting or adapt is adapting uh, in how they call it. And the problem is that they actually can find this beta parameter and they adjust to some adjustment. How many variables are in this place? So how many parameters? Like it's, it's coming up. Like those are the parameters that enter. Like how we have the beta, so what we call the multi dimension. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it can work. Sorry, yeah, it works. Yeah, it works. Yes, 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 it should be a lot because the lot of the one is that of course, of course, of course, of course. Of course. But the active number of the exact number of the Okay, good. Okay. So they have a bus? So how many of you uh, have to do the bus? The bus takes them to the... Oh! Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, so we can... Okay, so here, uh, just one it's comment. a bit flexible, but we should have told them earlier. Yes. Okay, so uh, this is the rest, then we can have uh, this uh, tomorrow, basically. And also we could uh, explain about the completion near network. But this is the, this is the eminence data set. It's images. And then I'll show you how, how can you do あ、そうそう。